props have this great value in that I can hide stuff behind them. Um, <laughs> it's one of these neat things. It's very interesting as we're looking in these scriptures and such that I'm preaching out of the same passage. We based off of, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. But the fascinating part to me, and you can see God's hand in this stuff, is I wrote my sermon without talking to Denise. And if you get to the end of my sermon, you will find Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, and Romans 10.9 and 10. There's a reason for that. God has a hand in a lot of this stuff. I wanted to point out, if you're in your pew Bible, we're going to be working out of page 833. We're in Colossians 1, 15 to 23. But on page 831, I wanted to point out Philippians 2, 15 to you. And I want to point that out mostly because I felt like it. No, um, they were singing this song over here earlier. And you're doing, we will shine like stars. And I remember the first time I ever heard that, I said, What? So I want you to look in Philippians 2.15. It's on page 831 of your pew Bible. And it's this fascinating statement. So that you may become blameless, pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you might shine like stars in the universe. As you hold out the word of life. See, that's what the kids were doing today. They were holding out the word of life to us. It's the concept of us shining like stars as we hold out the word of life. It's right there in the scriptures. Which is what was interesting to me about all of that. And the first time I heard that, I said, shine like stars. I'm going to shine like a star. Well, the Bible says it, so... Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so... Right? Let's pray, God. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come before you and we want to look at your scriptures and your word and the story and the information and the promise that you have for us in this today. Thank you for these kids, these young people, and everything this week. Help them to take it home with them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I also did want to point out, uh, Russ mentioned a lot of people. I wanted to point out, to me, there's a really neat group in the middle of all of that. I mean, besides the people who coordinated it so that I didn't have to. And that is, we had every day eight to ten teenagers come and help. <laughs> Almost half of our leaders this week were teenagers who have grown out of the program, and came back and helped to make sure the next generation could be involved. And that was huge to me. I really appreciate that. For all of you, I'm not going to go through everybody's name. I might forget somebody and then somebody be upset with me. But thank you very much. Now, is anybody in here a science fiction fan? Do they like Star Trek or Star Wars? Am I the only one? You like these movies? All right. This is fascinating to me because God created all of this, and I love these movies, and I love to watch them, and one of my favorite times is they get in these spaceships, and they say, they're going to jump to light speed. And they jump to light speed, and what happens? The stars go blurry, right? I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to ruin Star Wars and Star Trek for you. That doesn't happen in real life. <laughs> No, really. You also hear Han Solo at one point tell us that he made this jump in eight parsecs. You know that a parsec is a real word? But it doesn't measure time. That's the funny thing. It actually measures distance. It's 3.26 light years. And our universe is so big that 3.26 light years isn't big enough to measure it. 
They measure the Milky Way galaxy in kilo parsecs, which is a thousand parsecs, 3,262 parsecs. Just for relationship, anybody get, getting a little bit lost on that? Okay, we got some truck drivers in here. They, somebody makes a million and a half miles driving, they're wearing out of truck pretty good, right? One parsec is 19 trillion miles. That's one parsec. So we're talking kiloparsecs, thousand of them. That's 19 with an extra th trillion with an extra three zeros, which would be what, 19 quadrillion? It's a little further than Denver. It's a little <laughs> further than Denver. Well, and we're going to come to that. It's really fascinating because our universe is so big that a kiloparsec is not big enough to measure it. They measure our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, in kiloparsecs. We actually live in, if I can pronounce it correctly, Lanakea, which is a supercluster of galaxies, and they have to measure that in megaparsecs, which is a million of them. 19 trillion with an extra nine zeros at the end of it. Miles. It's 77 something of those across. But that's not enough to measure the universe. They have to go to gigaparsecs, which is a billion parsecs, to measure our universe. That's how big our universe is. That still didn't mean a whole lot to me, so I broke it down a little bit for you. If we're traveling at light speed, you hear people talk about that. If you're a Star Trek, a Trekkie, you heard him talk about warp speed. Warp is actually the cube of a number. So warp one is light speed. Warp two is the cube of two, eight times the speed of light. The fastest speed I was able to find in any science fiction is warp nine, 729 times the speed of light. Okay? Here's the problem. Our universe is so big that the closest star besides the sun, to us, is 4.2 light years away. <coughs> Doesn't mean anything. If we can travel at warp 9, the fastest speed in science fiction, it would still take us over two days to get there. That doesn't sound like a star blurring to me. <laughs> For relationship, I started looking. And if we decided to drive to San Francisco, that's not far enough. Seattle's not far enough. Vancouver's not far enough. To get the distance that we need, if we're going to drive 24 hours a day for 2.1 days, which is the time it would take us to make it that far, we would have to drive to Toke, Alaska. Now, if anybody's up for that road trip, let me know. I am always up for that one. <laughs> we'll go fishing and introduce you to my family. But that's how far you would have to drive to take the same amount of time. That's not a blur. Let me tell you, we made that drive. It is not blurring by you. <laughs> All right. So now that we've ruined this for us, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, the next time you jump to light speed, you're going to go, that's so fake. Of course, all of it is. But anyway, that's what happens. The theme verse is... He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So we're talking about this universe that's that big. And God created all of it. Actually, Jesus created all of it. And we know this. And we're going to come back to that in just a second. It comes from a longer passage, and it's the one that we're going to work out of 15, chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. It says, this is where we're at. And what we're going to talk about is the fact that with our galaxy this big, God, who created it, wants a relationship with you. That, to me, was what was fascinating. I mentioned Laniakea, 
our supercluster. Our supercluster is so big that if we were able to travel at warp 9, it would still take us 344,546 years to get across it. 729 times the speed of light it takes that long to cross it. And that God, the God who created that, wants a relationship with you. Let's look at this a little bit. I want to read the whole passage that we're going to work out of. It's on page 833 in your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. It says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel which you heard, and that I, that was proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and from which I, Paul, have become a servant. We're going to break this passage down. We're going to go through it a little bit, verse by verse. But I want to sum it up for you once more. The God of the universe... The God who created a universe so big that even if we could do science fiction speeds, it would take us 36 years just to get to the center of our own galaxy. Wants a relationship with you. And he made a way through his son for that to happen. That's really, if I can just sum it up, if I narrow it down to just a little statement, that's what this passage says. Let's go into it a little bit. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn all over all creation. Sometimes I've heard people say that, well, this is the image of God. He's not really God. But if you look in verse 19, it says, all the fullness of God dwells in him. He's not talking about something separate, someone else. All the fullness of God dwells in him. If you continue into verse 16... It goes on and he says, In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. That should trigger something in your mind. It should trigger this thought in your mind and it's this. Wait a minute, I've heard that expression before. And you might have heard in John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing that has been made was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you continue. Who was that? It's the Son. But if we go back, what does Genesis tell us? Who created the heavens and the earth? In the beginning, anybody know? Jesus. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. And Jesus, we have the same person. And the scriptures show us this. This is God. <coughs> created the heavens and the earth for us. See, I think of it because I have an analytical mind, I have a math mind, and when I go through things, I look at it. And if you remember when you were in algebra, if A equals B and B equals C, then what does C equal? A. So if we have God as the creator and the Son as the creator, what do we have? If A and B are the same, that's right, Jesus is God. One and the same. 
But this is the God of the universe. And I wanted to know if we could define this. So I looked it up. I wanted to know how many stars there are in the universe so I could define. What does it mean to be the God of the universe? And you know what the answer was that scientists gave? We don't know. They said that there are 100 octillion stars in the universe. Anybody know what an octillion is? Yeah, I didn't either. But I'll tell you what it is. It's 10 to the 28th power. It means there's a 1 and there's 29 zeros following it. There's that many stars in the universe that they know of, but the universe, they don't know where the edge of it is, so they don't actually know if that's the right number. There's that many stars in the universe. Who should say created that? Someone help me out. That's right. Jesus created that for us. He wants a relationship with you. Not only did he create it, verse 17, if you follow down in there, he holds it all together. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. The reason the universe doesn't just go, and it's gone, is he holds it together for us. He holds it together in this unique situation. It functions, it works, it doesn't fall, blow up, fall apart. The spin of the earth doesn't throw us off into space. And did you know I was just wa- reading the news this week, and all of a sudden scientists are saying, we're not sure if it would be safe for us to go to another planet to live. Because our planet is unique. It's metal-based. It has a magnetic field, which actually is what protects us from solar radiation. It's the only planet in our, gal- in our solar system that does this. Whoa, we might not be able to go to Mars, they said. They just put this out this week because it's so unique in the way God holds it together and protects us. I wanted to look at that because not only does he hold it together, but he's also so big he can measure it. Isaiah 40 verse 12 tells us that he measures it with the breadth of his hand. Now we got some horse people in here. What do we measure with hands? It's four inches, right? So if I want to find a new horse for a new kid and I want him to ride it, I'm going to go looking for a horse that's 15 hands tall. Do this. Is that a good size? 15 hands? Maybe a thoroughbred, I want him to be a little longer legged, so I want him to be 17 hands, right? He's going to be a racehorse. So that's what we measure in hands. And the scriptures say, God measures the heavens by the breadth of his hand. So we can go to IC1101, which is the largest galaxy, and God goes, oh, that, that, that galaxy is about 19 hands. I think that, hand, that galaxy is too big for my children. Let me find a smaller galaxy to fit. This one over here, the Milky Way, it's only 15 hands. I'm going to put them there. A God so big, he measures the universe the way we measure a horse. It's still personal enough. He wants a relationship with you. The description doesn't stop there. It tells us he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn, so that in everything he may have supremacy. He's the creator of all things, the first in everything. He's fully God. He's capable of anything. He's so impressive and perhaps even scary. Well, if he can create that, if we can't even travel across it, it takes us 345,000 years to get across it. And he goes, that's about the right size. That would be a little scary, right? People think of God as that big. And they think of him as impersonal and off in the distance. But see, there's a reason that he feels off in the distance to us sometimes. Can one of the kids repeat for me Romans 3.23? That's 623, 323. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, this is what separates us from God. And this is what gives us that sense of an impersonal distance. We're separated from God by our sin. 
He can't take anything less than perfection in his presence. He's so amazing and we've made these mistakes. Sometimes we say, well, I never made a mistake. I don't sin. I don't murder, steal, commit adultery. But do you lie? Have you ever been disobedient to your parents? You know, the scriptures list all of those as sin as well. God says those are sins too, and no sin can be in the presence of God. Because of our problem, because in the face of such an awesome God, this is it. So verse 20 continues with the idea of God being pleased to, through him, reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through shedding blood of his son. Can someone do Romans 5, 8 for me? One of the kids? Anybody? Okay. God demonstrates his... God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, that was God reconciling us to himself. God made a way for our problems. He saw that we were separated from him and no matter what we did, we couldn't come to him. So he made a way. He said, well, you're still sinners. Well, you're still my enemy. Well, you're still doing things in opposition to me. I'm going to send my son, the creator of all things, to die on the cross for you. And verse 21 goes on and he says, once you were alienated from God and enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. And in verse 10 in Romans 5 goes on and says, well, we were God's enemies. But Romans 6, 23, can someone do that one for us, Karen? You already did it. Can you do it for us again? <coughs> That's right. See, we were alienated from God because of our behavior. The wages of sin is death. This is what you earn. This is what you get for doing things that are wrong. Death. Eternal death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, God made a way. And that's what we go on here. In verse 22, he says, He's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. And he goes on in there and he says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, the punishment for sin is death, eternal death, because sin can't be in the presence of God. God is pure light and life. The scriptures tell us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And sin can't be with that. So God made a way. He made us clean and holy, pure in his sight, and free from even accusation. Because the scriptures also tell us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We're free from accusation if we have in Christ, Christ Jesus. And how do we get that? It's God's free gift. As we look at this passage and we see what's happening, we see this big God, he created the universe with a hundred octillion stars in it and counting, but he's so big he can measure his own creation with his hand. But he loved the world so much that he sent his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have eternal life. He made the way. Now the thing is, if somebody says, I have a gift for you, and they've made a gift for you, and they're ready to give it to you, what do you have to do? Is it yours if they're still holding it? You've got to take it. So how do we take it? I don't know if we can do this one as well. Romans 10, 9 and 10, anybody got that one memorized? Because if you confess in your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With your heart, you believe that he's justified, and with your mouth, one confesses that he's saved. 
That's right. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you're accepting that he is God. Not just a nice guy, not just a prophet, he's God. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not might be, not could be, not possibly, but you will be. Because it is with your mouth that you believe and are justified, and with your, or with your heart you believe and are justified, and with your mouth you profess and are saved. And the kids did this other verse for us. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's it. So here we are at the end of all of it. With God so big that he can measure the distance that we travel in 344,000 years at 729 times the speed of light with his hand and go, ah, it's about that far. Wanting a relationship with you. And some of us think, well, when I was in church before, it was all, you know, condemnation and things like that. But the scriptures tell us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The Spirit of God has set them free. God says he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The world is already condemned. We've done that to ourselves. God made a way to save us from that. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You see, the God of the universe, the God who created all things... (laughs) who holds all things together and measures the universe with his hand, wants a relationship with you, and he made a way that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to ask each of you, if you haven't ever believed that, if you haven't ever confessed with your mouth, please come see me as the service closes. We're going to close the service with this. The ladies next door would like us to wait about five minutes. Okay, and they're going to put up the pictures, but I'm going to be up here. Russ, would you raise your hand, please? Russ is right here. If you've never confessed Jesus is Lord, come talk to one of us afterwards. Well, this is going on because the God of the universe, the God who can measure the universe with his hand, wants a relationship with you.